Since the earliest days of statehood, the right to drain wetlands has been protected by a set of laws that enable farmers to maximize crop production. Current drainage law is, is an old law, and it allows for uh, one group or uh, sometimes, in some cases, if even an individual landowner has enough, enough land in one particular area, to force a drainage or an improvement of or a restoration of a, of a drainage system over another landowner or group of landowners uh, based on the amount of land they have in the system uh, or the uh, number of acres uh, of, of benefited land in, in, in a particular drainage system. Through a legal drainage system, if you have several landowners that will be involved, and let's say only one or two people are for the project, what happens is if there's more than 50% of that land is owned by the individuals, that want to put the tile in or the ditch system in, it is petitioned before the board or before the watershed district. And if they have that 50%, it has to be allowed. That's the catch, you know, even though uh, a number of farmers now have government programs in the lake bottom, there are two or three farmers left out of seven would still uh, want to farm that land. In actuality, I personally feel that probably our drainage laws have the, like Minnesota's drainage laws, have probably created a, a good deal of drainage because farmers kind of get in a panic mood and saying, well, boy, I, I better get busy and get that drained or I'm not going to, they're not going to let me do it anymore. Since the late 1960s, ditching and tonning permits in the state of Minnesota have been evaluated and issued by watershed districts. Watershed districts are primarily concerned with how farmland drainage affects flood control and water quality. Hartkoff's farm sits in the upper Minnesota watershed district. It is the largest drain basin in the entire district. When a permit request comes in, we usually have to look at the entire area that they want to drain. We go through old photos starting back in the 1980s. We look for wetlands, possible wet spots that should not be drained. We do that first locally in the office. Then we go out on site with the farmer. He explains exactly where he wants his ditches to go, um, how much he wants to deepen them. So we do a really thorough with the farmers. The biggest dispute is always I, I want to get rid of my water, but I don't want anybody else's is the biggest dispute. And somebody, you know, cleans out a ditch and it runs down onto the neighbor, and that causes a battle. Current law favors drainage, but farmers do have conservation options in the form of set-aside and buyback programs funded by federal and state governments. The Conservation Reserve Program, otherwise known as CRP, is a USDA program that pays farmers for up to 10 years in exchange for allowing a piece of land to return to its natural state. The Reinvest in Minnesota program, or RIM, enticed farmers to restore sensitive lands by offering payment up front and arranging a contract to determine the future use of that land. The Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or CREP, took over where CRP ended. Under CREP, farmers agreed to take certain lands out of farm use permanently. And when we enroll a wetland in a restoration program or in a protection program, we try to compensate that landowner appropriately because we know it is, it does, its preservation does come at a cost to them. I have uh, several pieces of land in the uh, RIM program. And I also have two filter strips along natural drainage uh, ravines that are in the CREP program. And uh, in my case, I've been very, very successful. I actually get more rent on that land than I do on the land that I rent out for farming. My rim acres down there don't look like it, but it's probably my highest priced land if I wanted to sell it, which I don't. But it, uh, recreational land nowadays is, a, is an extremely lucrative chunk of property to have. Under all three programs, CRP, CREP, and RIM, farmers are compensated relative to the crop capability of the land. 
However, despite the intentions of federal and state conservation programs, some farmers feel the payments and set-asides are not in their best interest. It's kind of tough for me to tell my renter that I'm going to allow ponding on my land because I'm going to change my intakes to a different type of an intake, and, and he's paying me good money for this land. The motivation for those individuals that no matter what hold out, it's, it's more of an issue of government is what it comes down to. There, there are several farmers out there that just would do anything not to have the government have any say in their land, in their property. It's just a right that they feel like they should be able to make the decision themselves and nobody else. The message is that this is a local issue. This is an issue of landowner rights over the rights of maybe the greater public. Uh, that's that's still an issue today. I mean, that's still the idea that we can control what's going on on our own land, no matter what anybody around us, how they might be affected. Farming is, is more in the category of being a gamble. You, you borrow a bunch of money and invest in putting in a crop, and, and you hope that at the end that you, that you get enough wage to, to come out in a profitable end. There's really no guarantees. You can take insurance and things like that, but probably that'll only be enough to make it say you broke even. Risk, survival, history, resistance to change. Taken together, these worldly and human traits complicate our relationship to the land, and especially wetlands. There's still a feeling on the part of farmers that if you take land out of agriculture, you're not allowing it its best use. That's still a real priority for farmers, is that you're not using that land. And by leaving it uh, fallow, then you're wasting its potential. Farmers are getting, as of today, you know, uh, prices for the crops that existed 40, 50 years ago, no higher. So it seems to me, by leaving a marsh, creating fewer surpluses, farmers will be getting more money for the crops. It's very evident that we uh, have more farm, farmland available than we need right now. And, and technology has been more than able to keep up with the increase in demand. So yeah, you're still buying a loaf of bread for uh, you know, a buck and a half. But uh, production costs for a lot of these operators have gone a lot higher than proportionally than that. Well, I think we've been sold a bill of goods. I think uh, farmers simply have been sold the idea by these large corporations that in order to produce a crop, you have to use these things. You have to use these herbicides. You have to use these pesticides. Farmers will do to the land what's profitable for them, what keeps their family fed and what keeps their, uh, their operation moving. The government policies dictate those things. But not just that, I think more and more corporations dictate how farmers are going to be able to farm their land as well. We need to come together and sit down and say, we need to be smart about this. We need to raise food. We need wildlife. We need clean water. What can we do? Where can we go uh, to find the right balance point for between, between wetland drainage and wetland restoration? Do they appreciate seeing birds fly over the farmyard? Do they appreciate seeing a pheasant on the roadside? Do they appreciate seeing a buck deer? in the marsh edge. If they appreciate diversity, I, I can't see how they can feel that the marsh is worthless.